Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. This title for today, this one topic which I have chosen, the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit, is a very mysterious thing. And it's not just one simple answer. One thing, if you are worrying, and there are people who are worrying, maybe I have committed the sin against the Holy Spirit, I can tell you now, stop worrying. You did not commit this sin. Yeah, because the people who commit this sin, they don't worry. They don't care. And that's what is a good sign for this topic. It's a very fascinating passage from the Gospel about a conflict that took place in Jesus' ministry as an exorcist. The exorcist is the one who is chasing away evil, that the one who is fighting the kingdom of darkness, as Jesus just did in previous paragraph. In this context, Jesus gives one of his most puzzling sayings about the unforgivable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So it's taking place in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. He returned to home with his disciples. There is a real controversy about how to translate these Greek terms. RSV Bible, Revised Standard Version, which is mainly used by the Protestant churches, is known as a very exact translation, and they were not that exact in this paragraph. The RSV says that when Jesus' friends cared about the crowds, they went out to seize him because he was beside himself. The NAB, the New American Bible, which we have in our translation, the church, says Jesus' relatives, not friends, Relatives went out to seize him because they thought he was out of mind. He became crazy. Now, this is totally misunderstanding of the ministry of Jesus. The original Greek literally means those who belonged to him, those who belonged to Jesus. So does that mean those who belong to his family, to his relatives, or just his friends from Nazareth? We don't know. We have just this text and the rest is much more speculation than really evaluating the real message from there. Some people from within Jesus' town had concern about all these crowds and what's taking place. But besides himself or out of his mind, it's a pretty strong reaction to Jesus' ministry, to, to the exorcising, chasing away the evil spirit. Who knows what they heard? It's a very mysterious text and hard to explain. So just be satisfied with this. There was confusion and Jesus needed to clarify. So the scribes and the Pharisees who arrived from Jerusalem were amongst those who knew Jesus. And they had a very special concern. They said, he's possessed by the devil. He said, he's possessed by Beelzebul and by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. So Beelzebul, an Aramaic term, is rooted in the Hebrew word Baal, which means Lord. So Baal or Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. Why did they come to this term, the Lord of the Flies? Because Satan, as the prince of death, a prince of darkness, a prince of decay, was associated with tombs and graves. So what do you have among the graves and dead bodies? flies. yeah. So it's quite easy why they connected this Lord of the Flies. is an appropriate title for the Prince of Demons, for the Prince of Darkness, for the fallen angel, for Satan. So the scribes and the Pharisees say that Jesus is possessed by a demonic spirit, and through the power of the devil, he is casting out demons in his exorcistic ministry. Just that you are at peace in your heart. The evil spirit cannot enter you unless you invite him. Yeah, he cannot enter by force. So if you did not invite, there is nothing. And, and then when you invite, it's very, very difficult to get rid of him. And this is a very strange, very serious charge against Jesus because it's like accusing that he changed the camp. He joined the enemy camp, which was, would be very bad for the work of salvation. So Jesus responds to the accusation with two related but distinct parables, like one after the other. The first of the divided kingdom, a kind of logical question. 
If I'm casting out demons by the power of Satan, then that means Satan himself is casting out Satan. Would you think before you say something? Because uh, it must be something logical if it's a valid accusation. So your accusation is irrational, it doesn't make any sense what kingdom would fight against itself. We experience this kind of fight between good and evil in ourselves, but you have to take side. That parable indicates that there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. Christ is fighting on the side of God, as Jesus puts it here, and Satan's kingdom is coming to an end. I mean, basically, uh, Jesus' way uh, of returning to their accusations, it doesn't make sense, and I'm on the side of God. That's the positive message behind this parable, behind this riddle of the divided kingdom. And the second parable is of the strong man. If you are going to enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, you have to tie him up first, and then you can plunder his goods. It's basic logic, you know, if you want to rope someone, you have to know how to deal with the owner. But see this puzzling thing. Is Jesus a thief breaking into someone else's house and taking all of his stuff? You should wonder somehow when Jesus is taking the parables, the dishonest steward or unjust judge. He was not afraid to take some negative example to make some positive teaching. One of the purposes, you will remember it. <laughs> Jesus, a thief? We would usually assume the thief is the bad guy. Commandments, you shall not steal. Yeah? And the homeowner is the good guy. So Jesus makes an unexpected twist in this parable. Jesus is saying that the strong man is the devil and he himself is the thief. Why? The goods Jesus wants to steal from the devil are the souls of those who are possessed, who somehow gave their life, their will, to the prince of darkness, to the fallen angel. So in order to take back the souls that Satan has bound, Jesus has to tie up Satan first to restrain him first. That's why you have these prayers of bounding the evil spirits throwing them at the feet of Jesus to disable them to do any harm to you. That's what exorcistic ministry is, winning back souls from the devil, winning the souls back for God, for the kingdom of light. So if you grew up in the village with Jesus as a cousin, maybe a friend of his, uh, and used to play with him in the fields, and now you see him coming back home into his own hometown and casting out demons, that's quite a change in the person after this 40 days retreat in the desert. And it's expected to be shocking. Something new happened. What happened to him? Jesus is telling us the reason for his exorcistic ministry. He's explaining he's not keeping us in some kind of darkness. All of it is a part of the battle. Battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Between Jesus, the thief, and Satan, the strong man. I would like to be stolen by this good thief to his own kingdom. So Jesus, ironically enough, has come as a thief to rob Satan blind. He wants to steal all back. He wants it all back. You remember that when they were tempted, the first people, Adam and Eve, they put their trust in the false promises. They followed the evil spirit. So they were not punished because the evil spirit came to them, but because they put trust in the stranger instead of turning to God, instead of asking for advice from the right source. So Jesus wants every human soul back from the power and dominion of Satan. And that's why he's doing this, to show that he has power of the kingdom of darkness. And that leads to the third part of Jesus' response to the accusation of him being possessed. So Jesus says, there is only one sin that can't be forgiven. It's an eternal sin that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So people speculate what is this unforgivable sin, the sin against the Holy Spirit. And we don't have one clear answer. There are several approaches you have to find which would apply to your own life. Mark's Gospel, which we have today, gives probably the clearest clue as to what it means. 
After Jesus' response, Mark says, For they had said he has an unclean spirit. That was a very serious accusation pairing Jesus with the opposite come. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit means calling the actions of the Holy Spirit action of the devil. And perversion is evil. Defend yourself against such thinking. Why? You might remember this dialogue between Nicodemus and Jesus, the one who came during the night talking with Jesus. And the starting dialogue between Nicodemus and Jesus was, we know you are coming from God. That was the statement example of the Jewish leadership. No one can do these miracles, these actions, if God is not on his side. The question what he was not sure, who you are, who exactly, you know, why did you come, what is your mission? They read it correctly. So accusing Jesus that the good things this was doing through the power of darkness, it was total perversion, blindness, hardness of heart. They saw Jesus casting out demons, doing good in the name of God and through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And they said not just that it was evil, but that it was demonic. All this trouble which you have in the world is because of trusting the demonic forces. So connecting God to the demonic forces was a real perversion. They took one of the best, the most holy things of God, and they called it one of the most evil and the most corrupt. So they called evil good, and thereby implied also that good is evil. It's completely upside down. Defend yourself from this kind of thinking. When you identify it, run away, because it's the sin which is unforgivable. In other words, their hearts are so hardened that uh, when they see the action of the Holy Spirit, they call it an action of the devil. The scribes and the Pharisees are completely blind to the goodness of Jesus and the holiness of his actions. They don't want to see it. Because we know from other guys, from the other Jewish leadership, they understood it's coming from God. So today, first reading, why is this first reading, why the fall of Adam and Eve? was the connection between Genesis, the first book in the Bible, and Jesus' exorcistic ministry. Just that you understand the structure of the liturgy in our church, in the ordinary time, the first reading, usually from the Old Testament, is somehow paired with the gospel. Some kind of connection, some kind of explanation, some kind of type. This is what happened long ago. It's updated, upgraded. The bar is raised up with the ministry of Jesus. And that's from the Genesis. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. We call it this Proto-Evangelium, the first promise after the fall of the first parents, Adam and Eve. God has plan B. God has the plan of salvation. It was a long time waiting till the salvation was completed, but it was promised at the very spot when they failed God. There is uh, the image of the battle between the serpent and the seed of woman, Jesus. Yeah? So in this battle, the serpent's head is going to be crushed, destroyed, killed. And in the Bible, the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, interprets the serpent as an image of Satan. So it's not our invention, our way of thinking, it's straight from the book, it's straight from the Bible. So the seed of the woman is an image of the Messiah or the future Savior of Jesus, who is going to come and destroy the works of Satan by crushing his head, chasing him away. So it's a symbolic depiction of a battle between the son of Mary and Satan, between Jesus and a fallen angel. So Jesus' exorcism, chasing away the evil spirit, are the fulfillment of this prophecy. Jesus is going to be at war with the serpent and will ultimately crush his head through the cross, through offering his life for our salvation. So Genesis chapter 3 is a cryptic prophecy of the spiritual warfare of Jesus in the public ministry, especially in his exorcisms, chasing away any kind of influence of the evil spirits. St. John Paul II wrote in 1986 an entire encyclical on the Holy Spirit called Dominum et Vivificantem, the Lord 
and the one who is giving life. In fact, he started to write it very early after his election, but then he was shot, the whole recovery, and that's why it was published in 1996. So you see how important he was calling, explaining the role of the Holy Spirit for the Church, for our world. In paragraph 46, JP2 gives an authoritative papal interpretation of the sin against the Holy Spirit. It's not only one possible interpretation, but one of the most common, the most sensible thing that you can understand. So, what is this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? This is from his text. Blasphemy does not properly consist in offending against the Holy Spirit in words, that you said something. It's something much deeper and much more serious. It consists rather in the refusal to accept the salvation which God offers to men through the Holy Spirit. It consists in the radical refusal to accept this forgiveness. So, if Jesus says that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven either in this life or in the next, it is because this non-forgiveness is linked as to its cause to non-repentance. In other words, to the radical refusal to be converted. So if you have this desire, if your conscience is biting you, go to confess your sins, be grateful. This is nothing to worry if you have this, because this is something good which puts you eventually in good terms with God. This is a gift of God. What's wrong? There is an image in Luke Gospel about the wedding feast. The king who prepared the wedding feast and he organized these wedding garments for these VIPs who came for the wedding. And when the king arrived and came to this banquet, he had seen one man who was not dressed in the wedding garment. There is really no any dialogue between those dialogues. Why? How had you come here without the wedding garment? But you know, some Bible scholars, they invented the dialogue between the king and this man. This man who refused to be dressed in the wedding garment, he told the king, either you love me as I am, with my sin, with my filth, with my darkness and dirt, or you can kick me out. And they kick him out. This was not a failure on the king who wanted to dress the person in the robe of baptism, in the robe of grace, it was the refusal. I don't want to change. And this is a very serious thing. So, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, then, is the sin committed by the person who claims to have a right to persist in evil in any sin at all and who thus rejects redemption. This is what sacred scripture usually calls hardness of heart. Just that you don't be harsh for yourself. This battle between the light and darkness, this sin and grace, is in which one of us? And it's sometimes very painful, just that you see how painful or how distracted it could be. St. Augustine, the father of the Church, if you want to understand how important was Augustine, we are in Augustinian Church. Whatever he understood, whatever he explained, it's still going through 1600 years. And this guy, if you never read, I very much recommend this book, Confessions, by St. Augustine. When he was involved in the concubine life, he didn't marry the girl, they have a child, and so on. And one day he realized that he is wrong, and he started to pray, God, please give me pure heart. You can find it in his own book. But silently he was adding, but not today. Can you see where the problem is? But he was not denying it. He was not ready to accept the transformation. So defend yourself from the situation when you see what is evil and call it good. In our own time, this attitude of mind and heart is perhaps reflected in the loss of the sense of sin. Everybody is doing this. Pope Pius XII, the Pope of the Second World War, had already declared that the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. These atrocities, murders, tortures, concentration camps, and all loss of sense of sin. And he added, this loss goes hand in hand with the loss 
of the sense of God. Sounds familiar? Just to give you an example, calling evil a good. Constitutional right for abortion. Constitutional right to murder innocent baby. This is what they are discussing. They what they already did in France. Calling evil good. It's unforgivable sin. You want another thing? June, Pride Month of Alphabetic, you know, calling sexual and perversion good. That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. Defend yourself, run away from these people because you will be thrown in the kingdom of darkness. It's still possible to do it. If you are sometimes confused and you don't know it's a church teaching or it's not church teaching, the catechist should be your defense tool. You can have it in your, on your phone, you can have it at your home, it's available practically everywhere. This is the official teaching of the Catholic Church. If you are not sure if you understood the faith, if you want to show somebody that they had the wrong idea of the church teaching, you go to the catechist, you find the topic, and you read the topic. And then you know everything which somehow streams with the catechist is a good teaching. Maybe it's not the best explanation, maybe not the best wording, but it's going right direction. Anything which directly contradicts the teaching of the catechist is not the teaching of the church. It's quite simple. So this is what the catechist is saying. There are no limits to the mercy of God, but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by not repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sin and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. Such hardness of heart can lead to final impenitence, refusing to repent, and eternal loss, hell. Just there, official teaching of the Church. Either you love me with my filth, with my sin, or you can kick me out. And he was kicked out. And so be grateful if you have this desire to make peace with God, to confess, to return, to get up, even if you fail again and again. So, how is it possible that the scribes and the Pharisees could see the work of Jesus Christ and say it was from the devil? The only explanation that really makes any sense is that their hearts were hardened to the Spirit of God. That's why I recommend I have my own private devotion, daily devotion to the Holy Spirit. Because you call light, the light of God will disperse all the darkness. That's why it's so important, that's why it's so vital. As John Paul was saying, he was praying the prayer which his father gave him for over 50 years. Daily devotion to the Holy Spirit. Might be short, but constantly calling on light to disperse the darkness, especially from our hearts, from our minds. Their hearts were so hardened that when they saw the action of the Holy Spirit, they called it the action of the devil. They were in that state of impenitence and hardness of heart that they refused, they simply refused the very redemption that God was bringing to them in Jesus Christ. And God respects our free will. You're making destructive decision, condemning yourself decision, and God will still try to save you. But if you insist, he will respect your free choice. There is a really sober warning for all of us, as you see it all over the world. It's not only here in the States. On the one hand, it's kind of a relief that you, the unforgivable sin isn't any one particular thing you, you can say, you can do. All those things you can say or do can be forgiven through the grace of God. You can prepare your confession, be contrite, confess the sin, make your thanksgiving prayer as penance, and it could be reconciled. On the other hand, it's a warning to us not to let our hearts grow hard by refusing to come to good terms with God. Learn how to receive the grace that God wants to give you. Learn how to read your conscience when it's biting you. It means it's healthy, it's biting, it's healthy. Defend yourself not to become so immersed in sin that when you see good, you call it evil, and when you see evil, you call it good. You can multiply the examples from our societies. That's a dangerous place to be in, and as St. John Paul II is saying, it's really the situation of the modern world. How can you call even yourself Catholic if you call abortion good? It's like telling Jesus that he was demonic. 
Our days are really characterized by a loss of that very sense of sin, and therefore the loss of the sense of God. And see the wisdom of the Church. The Church seeing this is protecting like a good mother trying to give us some tools to defend ourselves. So see and admire the wisdom of the Church. All people are invited to pray the liturgy of the hours every day. It is a duty for priests, nuns, religious people to pray it daily. I was promising this on my ordination to become a deacon, even before I became a priest. And uh, it's available in English and sometimes free. One of the morning invitatory psalms that inviting people to connect your life with God. If today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Like just a reminder, before you wake up completely, before you stand on your feet, you are getting, if today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Don't allow your heart to be hardened to the call of God. And this means we should always be asking God to give us the grace to have open hearts. For those who do not know, you can get this up laudate, free up. You have this divine office or the liturgy of the hour free. You don't even have to flip any of these pages you have on the cell phone for everyday proper way. If you want, you can buy, I bought it, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, divine office, audio. You travel, you drive to work, to shop or whatever is your... Why can't you pray? Why can't you use this empty time for reminding, for joining your life with God? So that when we see the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, we can recognize it for what it really is. The devotion to the Holy Spirit, the contact with the Bible, the praying every day protects us very successfully against the hardness of heart, against the sin, against the Holy Spirit.